This is an MJA Inc. Investigations Warning. This MJA podcast is rated E for explicit. Some details of a case and language used on this podcast might be upsetting to some of our listeners. Listener's discretion is advised. And for those who are still with us, kick back and enjoy the show. No greater honor will ever be bestowed upon an investigator than when they are entrusted with an investigation into the death of a human being. MJA Inc. Investigations believes in these words. You can read past public publications that MJA considers it an honor for us to work on the cases that we do. Welcome to our MJ podcast, Deep Into the Woods, the series MJ News Spots, Part 18, Cold Cases in Vermont and New Hampshire, Unsolved Homicides. My name is Mark and I am your host for tonight's show and joining me later will be our co-host, Miss Callie. I want to give a shout out to my daughter who passed nursing school and she starts work soon at the local hospital. It has been the best two years of my life for we got to babysit the grandchildren a lot. We are coming to you from our office in Plattsburgh, New York, located in the Adirondack Mountains. Unsolved Homicides in the states of Vermont and New Hampshire. These cases are just a sample of the unsolved homicides in these two states. From our research, they have cases from the 1930s that are still unsolved. 
let's make this perfectly clear. We have been searching for Brianna Maitland since April 3rd, 2004 in Vermont. After all these years, I can honestly say we have seen just a handful of state troopers and three of them, I called them myself. When we have been working on the Moore murder case since 2005 in New Hampshire, we have seen only one New Hampshire state trooper that was at one of the vigils for Miss Murray. There is no police patrolling on the side highways. This is why there are so many unsolved crimes in these rural areas. Haver Hill police bothered us for years until Boots on the Ground out of Maryland came into the picture. I just recently saw the photos of the police department and the one that bothered us wasn't in the photos. He tried to act like Officer McKay. It makes me wonder where he ended up. Let's get to the unsolved homicides. Case 1. 13 year old female found dead in Franklin, New Hampshire. On November 21st, 1971, 13 year old Kathleen Lynn Glody was last seen on that evening of a Sunday near downtown Franklin, New Hampshire. She did not return home that evening. Her body was found around 1 p.m. on November 22, 1971 in the woods off of Webster Street in Franklin, New Hampshire. An autopsy revealed that Kathy had been raped and strangled. She also suffered severe blunt force injuries to the neck, stomach, and head. Any of these injuries could have been fatal. Help us solve this case and bring justice to the family of this victim. Case 2. 18-year-old female unsolved homicide in Nassau, New Hampshire. On September 19, 1972, 18-year-old Kathleen Randall, a freshman from Boston University, was reported missing on September 9, 1972. The 18-year-old Randall had been missing from her dorm since September 13, 1972. Her body was found at the Yadaki Farm on Route 111A in Nassau, New Hampshire on October 1, 1972. All indications from the scene suggested she had been deceased for some time. The manner of death was ruled undetermined by the medical examiner because of the decomposition but the circumstances surrounding her death indicated that foul play was involved. The case has been treated as a homicide. Help us solve this case and bring justice to the family of this victim. Case 3 Housewife slain in her home still remains unsolved. Unsolved homicide. It was January 3rd, 1977, when 46-year-old Doris Maxfield was found murdered in her home in the town of Thetford, Vermont. The medical examiner at the time ruled her death a homicide caused by asphyxiation by manual strangulation. Her lifeless body had been found on the kitchen floor of her Post Mills apartment by her husband. He had just returned home at 8.45 a.m. that Monday morning after he had finished driving a school bus. At the time of her death, she had been seen alive an hour earlier when her children left for school. Originally, the regional medical examiner 
did not do an autopsy on Maxfield. He thought the death was the result of natural causes. A Vermont state trooper by the name of Danford O'Brien becomes suspicious of the marks on Maxfield's neck and had the chief medical examiner do an autopsy on her body. The case has remained cold for decades and it is unknown if there is a suspect. If you have any information about the case, you are urged to call the Vermont State Police at 802-241-5000. You can remain anonymous. Case 4. Abduction murder of a woman last seen in Vermont still unsolved. Unsolved homicide. 26-year-old Leslie Spellman was last seen alive in the town of Barrie, Vermont on June 18, 1977. Spellman had been hitchhiking her way to Arcadia National Park in Maine. Leslie Spellman was found bludgeoned to death in the gardens in the Northeast Harbor the next morning. Her dog, who she was traveling with, was found a half a mile away. It is possible that her killer may have picked her up and killed her in Maine. The case has been unsolved for over 35 years. If you have any information as to who have abducted and killed Leslie Spellman, please call the Maine State Police at 1-800-432-7381. Case 5. 42-year-old Wayward Bridge woman found murdered unsolved homicide. Wilma Scripner, a 42-year-old female, was reported missing on November 3, 1977, by her husband. Mrs. Scripner's body was found on March 21, 1979, located in Otter Creek in the township of Waybridge. On October 29, 1979, Mrs. Scripner's vehicle was located and recovered from Otter Creek. This was an area up the creek from where Mrs. Scripner's body had been found. An autopsy concluded that Mrs. Scripner's death was not the result of drowning, but was ruled a homicide. The case remains unsolved. Case 6. The 1981 unsolved victim, Mary Elizabeth, Elizabeth Critchley in New Hampshire. This 37-year-old Mary Elizabeth Critchley was last seen July 25, 1981 near Exit 13 of the Massachusetts Turnpike in Farmington, Massachusetts. Mary had been dropped off there by a friend and was hitchhiking to Waterbury, Vermont, where she lived with a friend. Mary was attending classes at the University of Vermont at the University of Vermont at the time of her death. Critchley was found deceased on August 9, 1981, in some woods that are located off of Unity Stage Road in the town of Unity, New Hampshire. The medical examiner was unable to determine a cause of death because of the condition of the body. But the thir circumstances surrounding her disappearance and death are suspicious. No arrest has ever been made in the case. Critchley's case has been popularly linked to the series of unsolved killings by the Connecticut River Valley serial killers in the 1970s and 80s. The cold case unit officials don't believe the cases are connected, but said that possibly can't be investigated fully until one of the cases is solved. 
Help us solve this case and bring justice to the family of this victim. Case 7. 1984 unsolved homicide of 17-year-old female in New Hampshire. Bernice Cormachi, a 17-year-old nurse's aide, vanished on May 30th, 1984 in West Claremont, New Hampshire. It is believed that she was abducted while hitchhiking to her boyfriend's house. On April 9, 1986, her remains were found in Kellyville, New Hampshire. Case 8. The unsolved homicide of a 26-year-old Claremont, New Hampshire female. Ellen Ruth Freed, a nurse that was last seen talking on a payphone outside of a convenience store in Claremont on July 22, 1984. Ellen Freed was talking on the payphone with her sister, commenting that a car kept driving by that made her nervous while she was talking on the payphone. The payphone was not far from where Bernice Cormonti just earlier had been found in the spring. Both women were of different ages and background, had a lot in common. Both had been stabbed to death. They were taken from the same area of town and the same section of woods in Kellyville, New Hampshire. Ellen Freed skeletal remains was found in a wooded area next to the Sugar River in Kellysville area of Newport, New Hampshire on September 19, 1985. The autopsy revealed the cause of death to be undetermined because of the skeletal remains that were found. However, the circumstances of her disappearance and the findings at the scene was consistent with Ellen having been sexually assaulted before her death. The case has been treated as a homicide. Please help us solve this case and bring justice to the family of this victim. Let's take a pause for the cause, and when we return, we'll profile eight more unsolved homicide cases. Be back in a moment.
Welcome back to our MJ podcast, Deep Into the Woods, the series MJ News Spot, and this is part 18, Cold Cases in Vermont and New Hampshire, Unsolved Homicides. Case 9, 27-year-old female found murdered in New Hampshire, Unsolved Homicide. 27-year-old Ava Morris, a single mother, mother, was last seen hitchhiking after leaving her place of work on July 10, 1985 in Charleston, New Hampshire. The body of Ava Morris, age 27, was discovered in West Unity, New Hampshire on April 25, 1986. Her remains was located by a logger. Morris was last seen on the morning of July 10, 1985, hitchhiking on Route 12 in North Charleston, New Hampshire. The medical examiner determined that Morris had been stabbed to death. Help us solve this case and bring justice to the family of this victim. Case 10. 36-year-old Saxton's River woman found murdered, unsolved homicide. On April 15, 1986, 36-year-old Linda Moore was stabbed to death in her own home. Her husband came home from work and found her dead. Linda Moore was a mother of two young children. Police have been seeking the public's help for years. Many feel despite the time that is past, it is likely that someone in the public has information that would lead them to Linda Moore's killer. There may be a person that think the information is insignificant or they may have been afraid to come forward for any number of reasons. We urge anyone with information to come forward and talk to police. The Vermont State Police was using a new technology to evaluate the existing evidence without being more specific. Some investigators have linked Moore's murder to a group of unsolved murders involving women in the Connecticut River Valley 20 years ago. But others have said that Moore's murder, where a woman was attacked in her home, was unlike the other murders, where the woman was murdered either hitchhiking or when their car had broke down. Since the day of the crime, many different detectives have spent countless hours investigating this crime. Unfortunately, the murder has never been solved. The Vermont State Police still believe that it is possible to determine who is responsible for this murder. 
They continue to follow up on new information they are receiving evidence with new technology that was not available back in 1986. Anyone with information is urged to contact Jenkins at the Rockingham Barracks of the Vermont State Police at 802-875-2112. Case 11. 32-year-old Manchester, Vermont woman found murdered, unsolved homicide. Sarah Hunter, who was 32 years old, was a golf pro at the Manchester Country Club in Manchester, Vermont. Sarah Hunter was last seen alive on September 18, 1986. The 32-year-old Hunter was reported missing to Manchester Police Department after her vehicle was found parked behind a local car wash. Sarah Hunter's remains were found on, in, in November of 1986 by a hunter in the woods in Paulet, Vermont. Evidence identified at the crime scene and during the autopsy during this investigation supported the classifi classification of this case as a homicide. This case still remains unsolved. Case 12. 39-year-old miss, nurse missing from Hartford I-91 northbound rest area and found murdered in Heartland, Vermont. On January 10, 1987, Barbara Agony's vehicle was found in the northbound rest area in White River Junction. She was not with the vehicle and evidence in the vehicle gave state police concerns of her well-being. On March 28, 1987, Mrs. Agnew's body was later found in a town called Heartland, Vermont in a wooded area. An autopsy determined that Miss Agnew was a victim of a homicide. Several women were stabbed in similar areas and had their throats slit. Case 13. 31-year-old Dover, New Hampshire woman found murdered, unsolved murder. The body of Sheila Holmes of Barrington was discovered on the morning of April 13, 1990, near the railroad tracks by Forest Street in Dover, New Hampshire. An autopsy determined that Sheila had been strangled and also suffered blunt force trauma to the head. Sheila also suffered multiple rib fractures and a lacerated ren renal artery. She was found lying on the ground in front of a blue Toyota pickup truck. Help us solve this case and bring justice to the family of this victim. Case 14, 30 year, 31 year old missing woman from Manchester, New Hampshire found murdered, unsolved homicide. On July 30th, 1998, Mindy West was 31 years old when she was reported missing. The 31-year-old West's body was discovered on October 4th, 1998 off of Hughes Road, a residential neighborhood of Manchester, New Hampshire. The 31-year-old West was tied to a tree with a rope around her neck. An autopsy revealed that she had been strangled to death. Mindy was a transit at the time of her di disappearance, but was known to frequent the inner city of Manchester, New Hampshire. Help us solve this crime and bring justice to the family of this victim. Case 15. 
Woman shot to death in her home, murderer still unknown, unsolved homicide. On November 1st, 2010, 44-year-old Roberta Bobby Miller was found shot to death in her home in the town of Guilford, New Hampshire. Police believe she was killed possibly the day before on Halloween or even the day she was found. The 54-year-old Miller died from a gunshot wound to the back of the head and her pet dog was also killed. The 54-year-old Miller had just gotten a divorce, but police have not said if that has anything to do with the case. There is a $50,000 reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for her murder. If you have any information about this homicide, please contact the New Hampshire State Police Major Crime Unit at 603-223-8573. All calls can remain confidential. Case 16. Human skull found and police want answers. A resident in a town of Danby, Vermont came across an unusual discovery on February 12, 2012. On the side of Danby Hill Road, he found a human skull. It was determined the skull was female and thought to be of a young Caucasian white female. There were ther theories that pointed to the skull belonging to either 16-year-old Heidi Wilbur, who had been missing since February 9, 1991, from Middletown Springs, Vermont. It could have been 21-year-old Maura Murray, who went missing on February 9, 2004, from Woodsville, New Hampshire, or 17-year-old Brianna Maitland, who went missing on March 19, 2004, from Montgomery, Vermont. All three were young white women who had gone missing in the last two decades within a reasonable distance of the discovery. The skull also showed signs of some trauma which indicated that it could have belonged to a victim of a homicide. The investigation took an unusual turn when months later it was determined that the skull belonged to a Asian female between the ages of 15 to 40 years of age. Searches of the area where the skull was located provided no other clues or body parts. If you have any information about this female or who she might be, please contact the Vermont State Police at 802-442-5421. On August 6, 1988, Jane Mor Morsky ex escaped death when she barely survived an attack from an no unknown man just outside of a small market in New Hampshire. She was brutally stabbed 27 times. Morsky was seven months pregnant. It is believed that she is the lone survivor of the serial killer that had killed at least six women. There have been suspects and, com and a composite sketch from the details of James Borsky. The same suspect has a former wife, Michelle Ashley, who is missing. The suspect and Ashley traveled a lot between Louisiana, Massachusetts, Virginia, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Vermont. During the mid-1980s, a suspected serial killer murdered at least six women along New Hampshire and the Vermont border. He attacked all the victims in the Connecticut River Valley near Route 91 in both Vermont and New Hampshire. 
Let's take a pause for the cause, and when we return, Miss Callie will be on the line. Back in a moment. It's with great regret that MJA announces the retirement of Miss Callie from MJA. Miss Callie's years of service will be greatly missed. In some of our upcoming podcasts, you will hear her name as being the co-host to the show because those episodes were pre-recorded before she retired. We would like to introduce our new co-host, Olivia. Olivia has a college background in science and law. Her and I have been working together for years concerning one certain case. Olivia is an excellent researcher. Olivia also wrote a report concerning our case in Louisiana by looking at the death room photos. By using science, Olivia proved that the death room had been staged. That report ended up getting published by the media in Louisiana and at least in five other states. It proves that our victim was murdered. You will enjoy Olivia's input to the cases our podcast will cover. Thank you, and be ready for our upcoming episodes. Welcome back to our MJ podcast, Deep Into the Woods, the series MJ New Spots Part 18. Cold Cases in Vermont and New Hampshire, Unsolved Homicides. We have our co-host on the line, Olivia. How are you tonight? I'm doing well, doing well. Ready to get started with this podcast. Okay. And I'd like to thank everybody online for reaching out to me about Olivia. And um, we appreciate the compliments and we hope to move forward and uh, just see how far we can take uh, different podcasts because we have a lot of interesting stories to tell and tonight's going to be a very good show. And Olivia, do you know that these cases that we are profiling aren't even half of the unsolved cases in Vermont and New Hampshire? Yes, I actually, I pulled from, <clears throat> excuse me, New Hampshire Department of Justice um, on their website. They have a bunch of cold case victim lists, cold case victim lists. Yeah. I counted 174 cases. That's just in um, New Hampshire. Vermont is a little, is not as easy to get into, so um, I know there's a lot, but I just found this astounding that there's 174 cases in New Hampshire not that big of a state and right. you know these something something has to happen here i mean families need answers oh that's that's for sure and do you find it odd that mja has been searching in vermont since april 2004 and we started searching in new hampshire in november 2005 and we haven't found anything link to any of these cases? I don't find it too odd because I don't find the locals, meaning the people that live in the surrounding area, I'll say more in Morris' case, um, or the police, very cooperative in giving any information out. I understand the police can't because they're active investigations, but... Uh, just the fact that nothing has been found on these girls 
it's just astounding. Um, you would think there would be something that would be found by this time. I mean, it's 17 years for both of them. It's kind of a long time. Yeah. And a lot of these cases we'll be discussing tonight is from the 1970s and 80s. That's unsolved, which is very shocking. And do you think that this killer is using a different dumping ground instead of Unity or Heartland, Vermont? Um, yes, I do. I think, um, I hate to say this if any of the family members are listening, but I believe because the areas are so dense, I'm speaking most more towards um, New Hampshire, these bodies could be scattered anywhere at this point. You know, I mean, there's a lot of places where you can hide them. And I don't think they're going to, if they feel that someone's on to two specific, specific, oh, specific areas, yeah. I would think that they would use a different one. Okay. And the early killings starting, starting in the 1970s seem to have the same M.O., do you think in the 1980s he changed his M.O. to look like a different killer? <clears throat> That's hard to say. Um, there is such a thing as copycat killers. I don't believe we're speaking about one person here that's causing these um, crimes. I think um, different people have has um, caused the crimes at different times. Um, as far as his M.O., from what I'm looking at, most of them were stabbed or blunt force injuries. Um, this is both in New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, you know, they're going to switch it up at some point, but I just kind of feel it's we're now dealing with a different set of people. Okay. Let's, I'll just leave it at that. And how many of these vic victims do you think came from the work of the Connecticut River Valley serial killer of the 1970s and 1980s? How many do you think he's responsible for? I think um, some of them were, were um, found in their homes. I would count them out. Um, this person wants someone to find the remains, so I would say anyone that has their the remains have been found in the open, I think that would be connected to the Connecticut River Valley killer. Okay. And most of these cases has been deemed the Connecticut River Valley serial killer victims. Olivia, these types of killings stopped in 2006. So what are we to think about that? I'm going to shock you. Stay tuned. He <laughs> took a break. They took a break. They're going to start up again. There's a lot of attention to both Brianna and Morris cases now. I think they're going to wait till it they it settles down or something is found or something, and then they're going to start again. I still believe these people are out there. And three so-called serial killer suspects killed themselves as the police was a moving moving in. The abductions and murders went on that are still unsolved. So wouldn't that say to you that there is another killer out there? I think there's three that work together. Okay, you think there's there could be three people working in unison, like they'll strike like something? Yeah, it's, it's not one person. It's not one person anymore. Um, I don't know. How many people were um, involved with the Connecticut River Valley? There were several, right? Yeah, there's... Um, Just refresh my memory, because I'm not sure about well, that. Well, it, it's been deemed, uh, I believe, up to 13 victims, and that's through the 70s and 80s. But then, like I said, everything kept going on after they moved in on these other three, while the killings and stuff kept going on. And, right. And in the same areas. So, yeah, you could be right on possibility that yeah, what I find curious involved. is that um, I'm going to go to Brianna and Maura again. Um, these other people, um, most of them 
Their remains were found. Brianna and Maura, there's like nothing. No evidence, nothing. Nothing's been found. Yeah. So it's it's a different it's different people than the people in the seventies and eighties. That's my opinion. And as as I was doing re research, would you believe I came across cases as far back as the mid thirties in Vermont and New Hampshire that are still unsolved? No, I I can't believe that because um, you know I frequented that when I was a child. I still go up there, and uh, to think that this was going on is uh, it's kind of concerning. <laughs> yeah, there's um, one case in particular the is an uh, uh, unidentified mother and two children. And it happened in uh, 1935, and they have never identified them. And they have many clues to go from, uh, from but uh, they never panned out. Mm. So that's one of the cases from the 30s that uh, I can't believe these people, after all these years, haven't been identified with all the new yeah, technology. It, it's, something's not right. Something's not right somewhere. And, what you know about the cases in these two states, do you think that law enforcement in Vermont and New Hampshire needs more training? As per law enforcement, I grew up in a family that was in law enforcement. My fiance is in law enforcement. Um, I live in a town, I'm gonna to just give you an example. There's 14,000 residents here. There's 55 police officers. Um, next town over, there's a little more people, but there's 60 police officers. I know the protocol for them is they have to either be military, have a college degree, and then um, you have to go to the police academy for 20 weeks. Yeah. Back in the 70s and 80s, I believe it was civil service, whereas you could just become a police officer right out of high school, but now they have a more, you know, it's more, you need more qualifications. You can't just become right. a police officer. Yeah, you, you know, you, I mean, we're talking about towns up there, you know, that are very small, you know, the little towns and not, I don't know what their procedure is for training, but um, I think if they should kind of fall into what we're doing here. You kind of need a background because these girls are missing. There's a lot of unsolved homicides up there. Yeah. I mean, more so than, more than likely down where I am. And they just need more, um, nothing against them. I think they just need more training. And uh, that would maybe help solve some of these cases. And do you Sorry, feel, that was so long-winded. <laughs> no, that's fine. Do you feel that some of these law enforcement agencies are taking up, up on themselves to send their officers to special training school, or do you look at it that everybody should attend that type of schooling? I think everyone at this point in time in this country, the way we stand, I mean, it's just, you know, the world has changed. You know, I, you have to have a certain type of training. I realize some people are frightened because some police look more military than others. But, you know, they need this training to protect you, and they need this training to solve these cases. Yeah. And from the 1970s to 2006, how many serial killers do you think were involved? I'm going to say between one and four. Well, you're close. As far as we can count, there's probably up to five that was operating from the 70s to 2006. And then, like I said, uh, we'll get on to uh, some of those suspects, and, and then you'll know why a lot of these cases are at a standstill. Okay, please say that Linda Moore was the last victim of the Connecticut River Valley serial killer in 1986. 
we then have to ask ourselves, who was abducting and killing after that? One thing I found, um, I made a chart, actually, of these people that are missing and, um, you know, they've been killed and they're unsolved. It seems to me most of these occur during the ski season or when college is in session. So it's someone that is looking for a specific type of person, albeit either a college student or someone that's just hiking. And in 1984, serial killer Chris Wilder raped at least 12 women and killed eight of them. On April 13th of 1984, Wilder was stopped at a Vicks Gaddy service station at the corner of Main and Bridge Streets in Colebrook, New Hampshire. Wilder was noticed by two New Hampshire state troopers, and then a struggle took place while the two state troopers were trying to arrest Wilder, who had a gun in his hand. Wilder's gun fired twice, hitting him twice. One of the bullets went through his back and hit one of the state troopers, and the other shot hit Wilder in the chest. Wilder died of his wounds, and the New Hampshire state trooper recovered from his chest wound. Do you think it's possible that Wilder might have done some of these killings in the late 70s or early 80s? I would have to say yes, he did. And another thing about Wilder I want to mention, um, we had a Jane Doe up here in my area. They called her Jane Doe Callie. Well, she was finally identified a few years ago as... Um, uh, Brandy uh, Joe Alexander and anyway the Florida authorities they tell me that Chris Wilder done it okay we have a composite sketch from a waitress at a diner where Alexander and this man she was with was eating lunch and from the composite sketch he has a full set of hair Okay, Wilder, if you look at his picture, he has a receding hairline, and he's almost bald. And, okay, between Livingston County and the jurisdiction down in Florida, we're fighting on who the suspect actually is on the case. Because uh -huh. the way I look at it, you have an eyewitness composite sketch, the guy has a full set of hair, Wilder's almost bald, so to me... It's just not a possible scenario that Chris Wilder uh, did it. Now, her parents did run a truck stop, and he did frequent that truck stop. But that doesn't mean he is the one that took her. <coughs> okay. Okay. And since the 1970s to 2000s... I just have a question for yeah. you, not to interrupt. Yeah. Can you carry in New Hampshire? Yes. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I just wanted to know, because a lot of these people seem like they have guns. Oh, yeah, yeah. And okay. since the 1970s to 2006, we've had three serial killers that killed themselves while police was moving in on that. All three were <coughs> operating in Vermont, New Hampshire, within a 300-mile radius. Then you got Howard Godfrey who was caught in 2005 by a DNA hit of an unsolved homicide from 1991 that happened in Stowe, Vermont. It was 28-year-old Patricia Schofield went missing on, uh, the, uh, on October 23, 1991, and six days later her lifeless body was found in Moss Glen Falls. Godfrey was convicted in 2008 of sexual assault and murder on Schofield. Godfrey was serving a sentence of life without parole, and he just died a few years ago in prison. So once again, we have a suspect that's known to taking women and killing them, and now that he is 
deceased, we have no way of questioning him on how many victims he did actually have. I have a question for you. Yeah. Can't they still get DNA somehow from him? I know he's deceased. Right. Can't they get DNA? I mean, there's got to be DNA on these, some of these victims that were well, found. Well, yeah, they, they have his DNA, and, yeah. Uh, well, they need to start matching it. You know, I mean, they just seem to, like, and I don't mean to talk out of term, they just seem to sit on things up there. I mean, down here, it would have been done and over with. You know, I mean, once again, there's yeah. family members that want answers, and it's it's just the human being, and I just I just don't get it. You know, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And then you have Brian Rooney, who killed Michelle Gardner Quinn from Burlington, Vermont. Oh, A God. jewelry store security camera showed Rooney walking with Michelle Gardner Quinn on October 7, 2006, at 2:34 a.m. Rooney was the last one to see her alive. Gardner Quinn's body was found on October 13, 2006 at Huntington Gorge in Richmond, Vermont. An autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and the cause of death was strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. Rooney was charged with Gardner Quinn's murder on October 25, 2006, with DNA evidence linked him to Michelle Quinn Gardner, or Gardner Quinn. Rooney is locked up in a Kentucky prison, and we are in talks to be able to interview Rooney. Rooney has also been charged with sexual assault on a minor and on an 18-year-old woman. Rooney is believed to have used ether soap cloths to subdue them so the women would be defenseless. Rooney's past of offenses should tell that there are more victims out there like the murder of Michelle Gardner Quinn. So with all this info we have on these killers, do you think they account for most of the unsolved homicide and missing female cases in Vermont and New Hampshire? Most, but not all. And you have visited some of these areas, and are you surprised that you found out years later that these serial killers was running loose? Yes. Um, as a child, we used to visit, um, me along with my parents and my sister, my dad had a, one of those Airstream silver obnoxious trailers, and we used to go up to New Hampshire every August um, to the camping grounds. And we used to go to Franconia and areas like that. And when I was in college in the 80s, we would, you know, groups of us, four girls, we'd just get in the car on a Friday and decide we're going up to Stowe, Vermont to go skiing. I mean, back then, you didn't have... Um, cars that were safe like they are now they weren't for I, I actually had one of those what do you call them mark an iraq z28 yeah that thing would get stuck everywhere people would push it out and you just continue on until you got to stow but looking at this now um it's scary we took chances not so much um because my my dad was in law enforcement um i felt a little safer with him but i want to bring something up that did happen um, I spoke to my cousin last night, and I was saying something about when we had uh, one summer, I think it was the last summer we were up there, in 19, I want to say 1971, we had gone to Vermont for a week, and something had spooked my mother when we were at the trailer park, and I couldn't recall what it was because I was only seven at the mm -hmm. time, so I called my cousin who was a little over the, older, they were with us. And he said somebody was in that campground and came up to the window of the trailer and freaked her out. So, you know, apparently craziness was going on back then. But, um, you know, when I think of the chances we took when we were in college, you know, you, you're in college. You don't think. You know, you say, oh, we're going to go up to Stowe, go skiing for the weekend. You know, you just get in the car. 
and drive up there. But uh, when I, if I would have known this then, I don't think I would have taken a chance. But then again, you're young. Yeah. And you think nothing's going to happen to you. And we do have an update on one of the cases we profiled, the unsolved homicide of Sarah Hunter. An arrest was made in 2014 of David Allen Morrison. But the charges were later dropped after the FBI claimed there was an evidence error. And do you have anything that you would like to add? I actually do, um, and it might help people out there and pre prevent any of these further um, disappearances or stuff. Um, as I mentioned, I used to frequent New England a lot when I was a child. Um, my father, unfortunately, passed away when I was seven. But last summer, um, we were up in New Hampshire. It was the last one there. Um, my mom, she didn't take his death well, and uh, she became a strict mother. So as I got older, I started to rebel and take chances. When I talk about chances, um, one thing in particular, Mark, you know about it. I took a chance on 9-11. Yeah. You know, my mother had told me uh, I was in those buildings in 92 when it was bombed. I got an opportunity for a really good job. And the interview was on 9-11. My mom says, um, I don't think it's a good idea to go. I just have a feeling something's going to happen. And I said, no, 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 no. You know, it's going to be fine. What's going to happen? Well, we all know what happened. I saw things no one should ever, ever have to see. I lost a lot of friends. I thought my cousin died. Fortunately, she was not on one of the upper floors above where the plane hit. She was on a lower floor. Um, what I'm trying to say is um, that was two times I was lucky. Third time working in a skyscraper, I might not be that lucky. I still am fortunate that I don't have any medical issues from it. Mentally, it's taken its toll. Well, I'm fine, but I cannot bring myself to that memorial because only people that have been in that building or there on the day that it happened will understand this. The ground does shake. I get the visions. I get a pounding feeling in my head where I can't hear. And... That smell, that god-awful smell, which I hope none of you ever have to smell, comes back. The point I'm trying to make is, like I had said, um, I love New England. My fiancé and his two girls and I went up to, um, about two years ago, we stayed in a cabin, and it was nearby where Maura disappeared. I remember passing the tree with the ribbon and everything, and um, it was fine during the day. What I wanted to do was introduce them to New England because they've never been there, and I was showing them pictures of when I was a little girl. We were in Franconia Notch, and, you know, on the profile beach, I believe it is. Correct me if I'm wrong. And they just wanted to go experience that. Well, it was fine during the day. At night, came back, decided to sit on the deck. And, Mark, I never told you this. I got this chill down my spine sitting there. And he looked at me and he says, what's wrong with you? He said, I said, something's not right here. I had been following Moore's case. I don't know if that's what it was, but some say I might be super sensitive to surroundings because of what I experienced in the towers. But I could feel somebody, like somebody was watching us. It was just a very uncomfortable to the point where I was getting sick to my stomach, and he said, well, don't let the girls know, you know, because they're little. So we stayed out a little bit, and we went in, we put them to bed, and he says, what's going on? And I told him, and he says, yeah, you told me about the case. And I said, you didn't feel anything? He's a police officer, and he says, I'm going to be honest with you. He says, I felt uncomfortable. I felt like somebody was watching us. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's my, I'm my um, what I'm trying to say is, if anybody listening lives in that area, I know you love hiking. You have a beautiful state. You have beautiful trails. 
don't think going there with your dog is going to protect you. Listen to what I said. You can only take so many chances in your life. Those chances run out. There is still someone out there watching people. If you need to hike, feel free to hike. But please, go in a group because I don't want to read about any more people disappearing. That's, for That's sure. all I have to say. That's for sure. And I just watched a three-minute video that states at this time, there are 250,000 unsolved homicides in the United States. As a country, we can't think those numbers are acceptable because in reality, it is a disgrace to our criminal justice system. Things need to be changed and changed fast. I have a quote for you all. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tunes without words and never stops at all. Emily Dickinson. Always remember, folks, if you ever get bored with nothing to do, well, take a walk deep into the woods. You might be surprised at what you might want find. I want to thank all of our viewers and listeners for tuning in, for you all have been so kind. I want to thank our co-hosts, for Olivia, for being here tonight. That's the end of our MJ podcast, the series, MJ News Spots. This has been part 18, the unsolved cold case homicides in Vermont and New Hampshire. My name is Mark. I was the host of tonight's show. Joining me was our co-host, Olivia. And we say all to you, good night from Plattsburgh, New York.